Good afternoon uh, to the committee, but also to those attending our meetings. Uh, as you know, I don't know if this is what our third or fourth meeting uh, assembly meeting of the Infrastructure Planning Advisory Committee. I'm proud to host the group uh, as chair. My name is Becky Keo. I'm Department of Energy and Environment Cabinet Secretary, but also uh, under executive order serving as the chair of, of the Planning Advisory Committee. A uh, number of you have Good to see you again and, and visit with us. We've scheduled a fairly uh, healthy agenda so we can get into that, but I wanted to welcome uh, those of you. I think we, everyone that's here, we have uh, Jim Hudson, I believe, here on behalf of the Department of Commerce. Thank you for attending. I know while Mike Preston is out, out doing state business, as they say. So, uh, um, and we've got, do we have anybody else that this is their first meeting? I believe we do, state police. Yeah, Colonel Bill Brown with the Arkansas State Police. Thank you, Colonel, for attending. I know uh, happy to have you designated now as the official member from your department uh, on this council or committee. So with, uh, just call the meeting to order and we'll go ahead and move into some agenda items. I did want to give just a brief update on the activities that have been going on uh, nationally as well as uh, statewide on infrastructure. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of outside of these meetings, our staffs are working collectively to assemble weekly reports of different activities and opportunities that the state is considering pursuing or grant opportunities. And, and a number of the committee members are also, I know, interacting with stakeholders, attending events, presenting on IIJA opportunities in Arkansas and helping coordinate ideas. So uh, those weekly reports try to capture that on a weekly basis. And those are shared, I know, with the governor's office, who I'm sorry, Chris, I meant to recognize you. We have Chris from the governor's office. Thank you for being here. And uh, those are shared uh, to the governor as well as across our committee. And those are available. If you're interested and you're on our mailing list, we can share that out of broader as you needs, but these are identified activities that are real time uh, efforts that are going on by various working groups across state government. And uh, believe me, IIJ has gotten very busy the last two months. There's a lot of, uh, I would say daily almost, there's a new notice from the, one of the federal agencies, maybe multiple notices coming out on different topics. I know it's been heavy in the broad, broadband area, a lot of notices coming out on broadband this month, a lot on the energy front. I know uh, Director Bingo here at my left has been working on a number of those and some of those we'll talk about today, but um, part of what we I do and uh, is try to stay up front of what's coming at us, but also try to interact with other states through the NGA, uh, so the NGA has been hosting, they all host a website that's an excellent resource to track uh, activities, but they've hosted several meetings for state advisors to the governors, including a round table that was held June 26th to the 28th and uh, both in Baltimore and DC. Uh, we attended, state advisors attended the Select USA conference, which Governor Hutchinson also spoke at, but we had an opportunity to participate in a round table with federal officials and, and a number of international business representatives about how, how IAJA um, opportunities um, might be an opportunity for public private partnerships. Um, there was a session on Buy America um, in building materials. There was a special session on electric vehicles and charging infrastructure talking about both from the public side and the private side, the interest, sorry, I'm bouncing. Uh, we attended a permitting action plan discussion uh, where they talked, the White House talked about their Fast 41 program and then attended the Canadian embassy where uh, there was a infrastructure session about Canadians P3 funding. If you're an infrastructure funding, uh, uh, more of a public private partnership on funding uh, systems that have worked well in Canada. There is a, Another meeting coming up at the end of July that Shane Corey and I will attend, that's called the NGA Energy and Critical Infrastructure Resilient State Learning Lab. We try to, as we go to these things, we're trying to share the Arkansas story, but we're also trying to bring back information. And so each time we're, we're, I'm working with staff to try to provide some notes and we'll start doing a, a hopefully a good summary of these as we go forward, as they may benefit you when we hear of an opportunity. But 
Uh, we also state locally, Thursday, August 11th, we've been invited to present at the Arkansas Association of Counties Summer Conference. And that's gonna, uh, I've talked to several members, I believe, Director Ward and maybe Director Bingle about potentially being our representatives there to talk a little bit about what we're going to be able to do and you know, what we're doing at the state level so we can perhaps understand what, what the Association of Counties priorities are. So I know they attended one of our meetings in the past that was helpful. So I'm going to move from that. I just wanted to uh, present that information to give you up to date. Um, there were two workshops that our staffs participated in. Colorado and Kansas both had infrastructure webinars with local and, and in case, so in case, virtual and in-person meetings to discuss IAJA with their local governments. And, and we've got some notes. I'll have that shared out and some recommendations from staff about ideas that they thought might be beneficial for Arkansas to consider. So but we won't discuss that today, but I'll share that in their notes to you and let you contemplate on that and see how we might want to move forward if any of these recommendations resonate with you or you think those are something that this group should take up as a follow-up item. Anyway, with that, I'd like to turn it over, though, to the Deloitte team, who's I know represented here by John Rampula here today, to talk a little bit about what they've been doing. I know they've been interacting with each of the departments to talk about some of our needs as departments, but also the opportunities that Arkansas has to hopefully be successful in some competitive grants. So I'll turn it over to you, John, and uh, if you are willing to share a little bit update on where y'all, where where you've been and what, what you've learned through the process. Secretary Drew and committee, uh, good afternoon. It's good to be back. Um, so Troy, we'll go to the, the first slide and pass the agenda. Um, I was, as we were putting this together, I was surprised that it's already been June 2nd since the last time we met. The time has come very, very fast. So first I wanted to thank you and your staff. You've been very gracious in entertaining us in uh, several meetings. You'll see we've had, uh, since June, we've had 15 meetings. Uh, we've had a couple repeat meetings or meetings on deeper dive topics um, with, your, with your agencies and staff um, over this past month. Uh, it's been very informative. We those first set of meetings have really been trying to understand um, where you're at, and I are thinking kind of where you may need some assistance uh, from us. And I'll talk about some of the assistance that's been identified uh, to date. So um, again, it's been a great partnership. I've been able to attend most of those meetings, and uh, I really enjoyed them and learned a lot about where you may have some needs. Um, moving forward, some of those needs that have identified to date, we're working on a few statements of work now, um, largely uh, with E&E, &E, and we're going to meet after this meeting on a few that we have in progress, but um, some, some common themes that we're seeing where you may need some support um, that were within, you know, the bounds of the, uh, the MSA are around strategy, uh, it's my practice, I call more strategy practice. Branch prioritization, many of you met Damon Armini. Damon is on vacation, we're gonna take some time off, but the grants team, uh, I can see some, a real opportunity to kind of help uh, either with grant reporting has been a kind of a common theme to help with reporting and analytics uh, to, to, to you know, grant writing where it's permissible, we can't help in the broadband area. And the other area that, that have, you know, stakeholder engagement support services having worked in and around government for 23 years is something that we can never do enough. So I think um, stakeholder engagement, support services continues to be an area, change management communications uh, that we see uh, opportunity. Um, I will mention that if you do, you know, as you're kind of moving forward with your planning, if you want to meet with us again, we're more than happy uh, to come back and meet, um, you know, for additional sessions. If you feel you need any help or you need any additional information, uh, you can reach out to me or Heidi Green, where the two partners leading, leading our work. Heidi leads all the work in Arkansas and I'm from our strategy practice. Um, so in the, in the coming months, as we hope to continue to engage with you and your teams as you further define, refine your plans and identify areas for help. Um, but in addition, where you may want some access to subject matter expertise as well, as I mentioned uh, back in June, we're a large firm with an energy practice, a transportation practice. We recently were able to bring some of our carbon experts from our commercial practice to have a, a pretty good conversation with Fish and Game. So um, 
more than happy to convene experts. Cyber is another area I know that has been of, of interest. So um, don't hesitate to reach out to Heidi and I. You know, we're here to help, no, we're not uh, in, in any area, but we'll be continue to be your primary points of contact going forward. Next. Similar to what Secretary Keogh uh, mentioned earlier, we had our grants team identify some areas that may be of interest to this team. I won't cover them in detail. I think there's probably some duplication here. And on the next slide, um, you know, Kansas, Colorado are prominently mentioned here as well. So um, again, uh, just a little bit of additional information for you, a short reading list, summer reading list. If this conjures up any thoughts, ideas, or, or ID, um, need to speak with us or desire to speak with us, again, let Heidi and I know. Um, Secretary mentioned NGA. Um, Heidi couldn't be with us today. She's ill. She fell ill after NGA. Um, there's a connection there. But um, at NGA last week, one of the things Heidi shared with me is that um, she continues to view the committee here as leaders. Um, we commissioned back in December. Um, from her interactions, uh, states are at varying levels of, of getting organized. Um, I spend a time in the Northeast, and I know in the Northeast, um, they're still getting very organized in most places. Um, so her, her, uh, her counsel to me was, you know, uh, you're, you're far ahead, um, and it's going to take some time. I think everyone's still trying to understand, you know, the, the legislation and the monitoring the various websites, but um, uh, she wanted me to relay that uh, the, the committee here is, is seems to be a great idea and, and leaders. Um, the next slide, the last slide that we had by way of update today, I think similar to Secretary Keogh is our grants team uh, was calling through where the, the largest dollar opportunities, um, you know, transport continues to be of keen interest across the country and infrastructure. Um, broadband, um, obviously transportation, EV, um, and then power energy recently. And so I think that um, kind of Search your queue, and we are kind of tracking the same information and see the same opportunities as you. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I hope that these conversations have been helpful uh, to the departments, but also as Deloitte works with us, I don't know if I know that we're all struggling to determine what funds we can use yeah. to procure those contracts, um, be it if we already have some federal funds in house that. Can, you know, with permission can be used for pursuit of proposals similar like on the EV. I believe there was an opportunity to use some of the first year program funding to work on plans and things like that. But um, we're also in our energy office looking at other DOE funds that we could use, things like that. But I, I would encourage folks to continue to explore those. I believe one of the staff recommendations that I'll share with you that, that I'll be sharing with you was pursuit of maybe technical assistance funding opportunities under um, a recently released guidebook that, that was released by the White House. So that might be another source that we can actually pursue some technical assistance funding that will help us be positioned to do the next level of effort, be it, it hopefully get awarded and pursue the work. And that may be something you and we need to talk to Deloitte about. Do you know anything about that opportunity, the technical assistance? I'm not right now. Okay, well, we'll follow up okay. after this discussion and see if that might be a, a good source. I know that's talking to, you know, the governor's office and DFNA. Where's Ellen? I lost Ellen. There you are. That's one of the questions that came up in our conversations about how do we go, how do we go that next step? So. I think one of the other areas, Secretary Keogh, that we, identified, we mentioned in the first meeting and after meeting with Commerce, I think is, is an area is, is, is workforce being spread across multiple areas and uh, coming together and sort of collaborating across various workforce development opportunities as well. I think we counted hundreds of references to workforce uh, in our meetings. So that was another area that uh, we've been talking with our human capital practice. We've been doing a lot of work around workforce and you know hope to get back with, with Commerce. I think we've got both our grants folks and our human capital folks together. So we'll be reaching out shortly to get back together on workforce. That's great. And I know these national discussions, I'm sure in your conversations, we the, the words I hear repeated often is supply chain and workforce yeah. are, are some of our opportunities, but also our limitations in some of this work. And so we want to make sure we are capitalizing and putting as much synergy in our work if we can if we can 
work smarter, perhaps we can work through some of those challenges a little faster. But uh, with that, I appreciate your time today. Thank you for the report. Did anyone have a question before we let him away? I'm sorry. At this point, okay. Well, thank you. I know Deloitte has been an excellent partner so far. It's a new relationship. We'll continue to build on that. So thank you for being here today and, and for attending. Um, I'll shift now, speaking of another partnership, if, if, you, if you recall, if you've been in these meetings, we talk about donors' priorities of partnership and, and also regional, you know, regional coordination, um, and we can talk about that. But one of those areas that highlights both those strengths um, is our next agenda item, which is our electric vehicle plan update, and I would, I guess, turn it, Director Tudor, it's your report, but I believe you've got a planned We've got a planned introduction that may start over at the Department of Energy. So do you want to open it up for a moment about just introduce the team or how do you want to handle that? Well, sure. Um, it's just, it has been a great partnership and we're moving forward and we've made great progress and they're going to update us on that progress today. Mitchell Simpson, first up from the Department of Energy and Environment. I'm not sure of your title, but Mitchell's been a great partner this work, we're just working well together and getting this done. So Mitchell, I guess I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Good afternoon, committee. Mitchell Simpson, director of the Arkansas Energy Office, which is an entity of the Department of Energy and Environment, or e and &E. I mean, I'd like to introduce Brad McCaleb. He's division engineer in transportation planning and policy at the Arkansas Department of Transportation or as we call it, RDOT. So for the last few months, E&E &E and RDOT have been collaborating on Arkansas's electric vehicle infrastructure deployment plan, specifically a response to the National Electric Vehicle Opportunity, Investment Opportunity, excuse me, Infrastructure Opportunity. So Troy, could you go to the next slide, please? So Director Tudor and Secretary Keogh, um, asked us to come provide a short update on the planning process so far. So as you see from the agenda, I'll provide a quick overview of NEVI, as we call the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure. Um, and Brad will come up and provide an update on the process and share some key points that we've discovered as we've been involved in our collaboration. And then we will allot some time for discussion. So next slide, please. So the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Formula Program, or as I say, like we, as I said before, we call it NEVI, um, is a $5 billion grant program uh, that was established by the bipartisan infrastructure law to build a national network of 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations by calendar year 2030 along federally designated alternative fuel corridors. To make sure everyone understands an alternative fuel corridor, you can think of it as a series of a certain alternative fuel distribution, in, in this case, electric vehicle chargers that are located along an interstate or other major corridor for the convenience of the traveling public. Um, so NEVI will provide funding to states, including Arkansas, over a five-year period to strategically deploy electric vehicle charging stations as well as increase access to electric vehicle charging to folks who travel across state and even nationwide in electric vehicles. So what you'll see throughout this presentation, as I mentioned earlier, are some key updates and key points that we've discovered and that we've inputted into the program as we've worked with our stakeholders throughout this process. It's important to note that this plan is based on proposed rules um, so it is, so some key points are subject to change as we reconcile the plan with final rules as we begin working through that process. Um, but as of now, what you'll see are the key updates as they are. Um, Troy, could you go to the next slide, please? So Arkansas will receive $54.1 million in NEVI program funds over the next five years, beginning with $8 million here in calendar year 2022. Arkansas will be required to build out the interstates and alternative fuel corridors before being able to move on to other roadways in the state. Some examples of alternative fuel corridors in Arkansas currently are portions of I-30, 
Interstate 40, uh, 49, and recently um, Highway 412, portions of Highway 412 um, were, were designated as an alternative fuel corridor. So once we are certified as fully built out by the US Department of Transportation, as I mentioned, we'll then be able to move on to other major roadways or routes of significance, as you'll hear um, us refer to them throughout this presentation. Next slide, please. So what does fully built out even mean? So fully built out means that there is a charging station every 50 miles within one travel mile of an exit. It also means that, the, that they must be publicly accessible direct current fast charging stations, or as we call them, DC fast chargers, with at least four 150 kilowatt DC fast charging ports that are able to provide that charging simultaneously or charge four vehicles simultaneously. So that means 600 kilowatts of energy on demand per hour must be available at these charging stations. The other factor or characteristic is that they must use combined charging system ports. So that's a specific charging port configuration that most electric vehicles use. We also, we often get asked, well, what about Tesla? <laughs> Tesla uses a um, specific charging port that is different from this. So currently, Tesla would not be, Tesla stations would not be eligible for this funding unless they change their charging port configuration to allow use by other vehicle types or other electric vehicles. Um, it's also one interesting fact when we talk about the charging uh, demand of 600 kilowatts, uh, for comparison's sake, um, the average home, uh, about 2,300 square feet, uses a, a little bit under 900 kilowatts a month in electricity. So as I mentioned, these chargers must provide 600 kilowatts on demand per hour. Um, next slide, please, Troy. And so this slide here details the 14 components that go into uh, the electric vehicle plan that e and &E and RDOT have been collaborating on. This plan is due August 1st, and the U.S. Department of Transportation has committed to provide a determination on our plan by September 30. Um, but this slide here illustrates the 14 components. Some particular points I'd like to point out, some of the more critical points are, include the state agency coordination, which e and &E and RDOT have been collaborating as well as engaging other state agencies in a working group to develop this uh, plan. The public engagement piece is also critical. We've had ongoing discussions with various stakeholders, both independently and collectively to get input on this plan. Um, there are equity considerations. The plan does require that at least 40% of the benefits uh, go to uh, underserved areas, if you will. Not necessarily the funding, but just the benefits must flow. And then we have to be attentive to workforce considerations, workforce training, as you heard John mentioned, is throughout all these investment uh, or infrastructure opportunities. And then another key point is that we have to be focused on cybersecurity to make sure that with these stations being data connected, the malicious code doesn't get inserted to um, compromise a vehicle or charging station. Um, so next slide, please, Troy. So with this, at this point, I'll turn it over to Brad to come walk you through the process today and to provide some key updates, Brad. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, no one warned me uh, what a good public speaker Mitchell was. I'm kind of regretting following him. Uh, uh, but Secretary Keogh, thank you for the opportunity to come and present uh, this information to the committee today. Uh, Troy, if we go to the next slide, please. So uh, one of the first things we did was to create a project management team uh, and hold pub uh, weekly meetings of the project management team. The team includes key RDOT staff, as well as e, e Division of Energy um, staff, and staff from the um, Arkansas's USDOE designated Clean Cities Coalition. Next slide, please. We brought HNTB consulting firm in to assist us with the development of the plan. They are a national architecture and engineering firm with a focus on infrastructure solutions. 
HNTB has worked with RDOT on many historical and current uh, projects. <laughs> They're also assisting nine other state DOGs and the District of Columbia in development of their plans. Next slide, please. A major component of our stakeholder engagement was the creation of the electrification working group. We held meetings with this working group in June and July. At the meetings, members were provided with key NEVI program information related to strategic decisions and discussion and input. The working group was also shown advanced versions of key components of the draft plan for their review, comment, and additional feedback. Next slide, please. To engage with the general public in a timely manner, we hosted a virtual public involvement session on June 21st. And I say timely because when we started work on developing this plan, we had eight weeks to get it completed and submitted by August 1st. So we're moving very quickly. Uh, there were 84 participants uh, that attended the virtual session. After the formal presentation, the project management team members responded to questions that were posted online by the attendees. And a recording of this event has been posted to our NEVI website for public review. Additionally, fact sheets and frequently asked questions and other resources related to NEVI have been posted on that website. Next slide, please. On Tuesday, July 12th, we posted the draft plan for public review and comment. That comment period is open until 11.59 p.m. on July 19th. So tomorrow, just before midnight, uh, if anyone would like to go in, review that plan, provide your comments and, and input, we would appreciate it. Um, this plan has also been provided to the Federal Highway Administration's Arkansas Division Office for their uh, review. And we've also sent the plan to the Federal Joint Office of Energy and Transportation and requested an advanced feedback uh, before our official submittal on August 1st. Next slide, please. We've also been coordinating with our neighboring state departments of transportation uh, to understand where key gaps may be along the borders. Uh, because all of the neighboring states are also developing a competitive procurement program, uh, we don't know exactly where the charter is going to be located at this time. Coordination with our neighbors will continue throughout the five-year NEVI formula funding program. Next slide. Uh, so in the following slides, I'm going to present some key updates from the draft plan. Uh, as Mitchell stated earlier, please note that these are subject to change based on uh, stakeholder comments and the final rules published by USDOT. Next slide. As previously stated, NEVI requires that we build out the interstates and the electric vehicle alternative fuel corridors first. Our strategy for accomplishing this is to spur investments in the EV supply equipment charging stations through a competitive procurement process. Once we are certified as fully built out, the next phase will be to move to other routes of significance likely U.S. routes and state highways with high travel, uh, travel volumes. If funding remains, uh, after providing the sufficient regional coverage, our DOT will use feedback from our ongoing public and stakeholder engagement to determine additional priorities. Next slide. The NEVI funds will be awarded through the competitive procurement process to third party owner operators. The initial eligible locations will be gaps in the charging network on the interstates and alternative fuel corridors. RDOT will establish pass-fail criteria based on the minimum requirements of the NEVI program, as well as additional scored criteria to select final awarded parties. Next slide. The competitive procurement program must still be developed. We will then have to publicize it. Uh, we will applications. Those applications will be reviewed and then awarded, and then the prog program must continue to be managed. The timing on all of this is uncertain at the moment because the NEVI rules are still out for public comment. Next slide. We will have to know and incorporate the final NEVI rules uh, into our competitive program. It's possible that the final rules will not be available until next summer. However, 
We are, intent we are intending to release the competitive procurement and grant program to coincide with the final rulemaking process. Next slide. Based on the information from top 10 EV charging station companies, we're estimating the average cost for each location to be approximately $1 million. This includes utility site make ready upgrades, the hardware installation, and everything needed to activate the EV charging station. At $1 million per NEVI site, Arkansas will have sufficient NEVI fiscal year 22 and 23 funding to fully build out approximately 15 locations along the 11 gaps in the network that we've identified. This will leave a significant amount of funding to build out other key routes uh, on a, for additional priorities in the years 2024 through 2026. Next slide. So the, the website where we have uh, our draft plan is posted there. And then there's also a special email address. If you have any questions or comments, you can email us at uh, that address and we will respond. Uh, and Troy, if you will skip the next slide, I believe um, Mr. Mingle had some comments he wanted to share. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Director Tudor, I just want to congratulate uh, your team you assigned to this process. It was an excellent team, and uh, it was a real privilege working with all of them. I served on the electrification group as well as the ma internal management team. So it was a it was an excellent opportunity to work together with two different agencies. So I appreciate that. But the real person behind this is Brad's uh, counterpart, Aaron. He's not here, so. Pass that on it that Aaron's name was mentioned. <laughs> he was the glue that held the committees together. I wanted to follow up a little bit <clears throat> because as you heard, there's $5 billion for uh, EV infrastructure. In addition to that, in the infrastructure bill, there's an additional 2.5 billion for EV and electric or uh, alternate fuel uh, vehicle fueling. Uh, split between 1.2 billion for EV and 1.2 billion for um, alternate fuels. Those are competitive grants. This particular grant to RDOT is a formula grant. Uh, that 2.5 billion will be competitive grants. There's where agencies, states, municipalities, towns, uh, folks can uh, compete for those grants uh, by submitting uh, grant applications. Uh, the guidance for that will be released, I believe, this fall is our expectation. Our plan is, we've been in conversations with Deloitte, with E&E, &E, is to prepare to submit the competitive grant to, well, as you look at the slide, the red area, there are additional sites that NIVI uh, would uh, address uh, once the uh, major routes are built out. Uh, but that four years or so down the road. Uh, our hope is to apply for the competitive grant uh, through E&E &E and in consultation with other state agencies and groups to build and develop a plan that will provide funding for beyond the NEVI sites. And that would be on the uh, game and fish sites, for example, uh, parks, other uh, more rural routes, and rural locations. So our hope is to build that uh, plan uh, once that guidance comes out and then build on to uh, what NIVI is, which is really geared towards the major um, highways in the state. You know, next slide. So if you were to look at this map, what you see in its kind of color, there's a light yellow, uh, obviously the blue, the red, these are the traffic patterns, traffic usage in the state for the roads. Uh, NIVI is obviously going to build out all of those colored highways, and you see there's 65 and the other interstates, uh, and certainly NIVI will address those highly traveled uh, uh, state routes, but all the other areas in between may or may not get funding through the NIVI program, but that's where we hope this competitive grant then will be able to fill in those areas of the state not covered by the, covered by, uh, the NIVI program. We go next slide. 
That's not to my slide. Backwards. <laughs> oh, this is go backwards. There we go. So I just wanted to bring that up. That uh, uh, even though when when folks look at this plan and, and they don't see sites locations beyond the major highways, we do have something in the works to continue on that build out uh, into the more rural areas of the state using a, a, an additional. A competitive grant process or uh, the infrastructure bill. Thank you, Director Bingo. I know he has been, as a director, tutor, been very focused on this plan. And we've spent a lot of time, and I appreciate the team. They've done a great job keeping me brief, keeping Director Tudor brief, and, and working on this. And, and we do think it's important that people understand kind of where we are and what the expectation is on timing, because I know there's a lot of news on EV infrastructure and some people think it's tomorrow. And as you can tell, it doesn't happen overnight. So what we were trying to do is make sure we manage some expectation, but you know, we want and desire this infrastructure to be rapidly deployed if we can. A rapid is a relative term when you talk about a five-year window, but it, that's an important, emphasis that we're making to be ready for the transition of fleets as we know have been announced. So we do wanna make sure that's coming uh, to meet not only our general public needs, but our commerce needs, our tourism needs and our agriculture needs, which also has some opportunities I know, but we're also pursuing a hydrogen corridor type designations. We will begin that process shortly working with the states of Louisiana and um, Oklahoma through our Halo Hub proposal. We've spent a lot of time on that. That is a separate, it, it has different benefits, but it does in the area of mobility, that uh, hub proposal will be uh, to address more long distance um, trucking and that those kind of needs where the EV uh, technology may not uh, be as functional or appropriate. And uh, plus it then brings some other benefits to reducing emissions across uh, some of our industrial uh, applications as well as people look at uh, ways to use hydrogen as an energy source. So I just bring that up because there are some other clean energy options as we look at these alternative fuels, as you mentioned, alternative fuel corridors, and that's a separate set of funds uh, through DOA. So none of this EV money would be spent on that. This is a separate funding opportunity that that we'll be pursuing so a lot of work on that as well so but I wanted to turn it let's go back to EV for a minute see if you have questions about it because I know it's a current topic and I, I, one of the aspects of this next beyond NEVI as we call it beyond NEVI is to I think bring stakeholders and then get I think that would be the first step as Deloitte thought to bring the stakeholders together about what are those priorities areas and what are those important areas that might get left behind or might need a more timely uh, response. And so I think the state agent, state departments uh, interacting with you will be a key part of that stakeholder engagement, as I recall. So I uh, wanted to first, if you're gonna question, I'll let, let Director Bingle or take the, or Director Tudor, do you wanna receive the questions and then direct them where they need to go? I'll, I'll, I'll make you the spokesperson on that, so. Yeah, generally, we'll ask this question maybe for Mr. Simpson, but in your presentation, you mentioned there were some labor and workforce considerations that were being made. Uh, just curious kind of what those considerations look like. Are you looking at uh, allocating some funds towards towards that workforce? I'm sure there's some some licensing requirements, perhaps when individuals have to work on this, perhaps above and beyond just a standard electrical license. So just curious if you could expand on that a little bit. Um, I can for a second. Um, so yes, sir, the specific requirements have not been fully fleshed out yet, but we will be tasked with making sure that we develop um, sort of a workforce training initiatives and making sure that, that there is an appropriately competitive um, sort of opportunity for contractors to bid on these jobs. Um, but we also need to be considering diversity of workforce and all of those initiatives. So it's just essentially about making sure that we have a broad set of workforce, making sure that we have certified workforce that can deploy these um, charge, this charging infrastructure, if that's helpful. Other questions? 
I know that utilities have been key partners to that end as far as, you know, how we deploy this technology and making sure that supply chain needs are going to meet, but also that, like you said, workforce development is going to be critical. And again, can we can we plan these projects also in concert with say broadband or, you know, or, or if there's a broadband strategy, can we, can, that might be a factor that they can, you know, DOT can consider as they are competing those proposals so that the timing, we're digging up the ground once as opposed to four times, right? We don't want to dig up a new highway, do we, Director Tudors? <laughs> I know we can. <laughs> I just think for us, you know, I mean, obviously we make a lot of investments in workforce training and education inclusive of telecommunication, broadband and other things. And so <clears throat> if there's requirements above and beyond for specific, you know, details as it relates to these, this infrastructure that's going to be put out there, than what we're doing in our standard electrical licensing occupations and trades or other programs that we have, then how do we leverage what we're doing at current locations around the state to maximize that benefit that we could probably reap from, from cross-training individuals and adding additional certifications or license requirements on top of it that need to be met in order to be able to be able to do this kind of work. Yeah, come up. To that point, Mr. Waits, there, there is an additional requirement for electricians uh, but my understanding is that's going to be made available online. So it's a course that they can go in and take online, receive that certification so that they'll be eligible to work at these charging stations. Thank you. Great information. Oh, one more question down here. I do have a question. These are to be spread out every 50 miles. Yes. So and with it being spread out every 50 miles, is it is there the possibility that these can also have a dual role as acting as sort of a hot spot for the uh, community? Uh, yes, there, there's that possibility. We are not prescribing uh, the locations for these sites other than to identify where we have gaps. Uh, our DOT's position is the private sector would be better at identifying those locations, looking at all the factors that have to be taken into account. Um, but I did mention we would have additional scoring criteria. Some of those would be what types of amenities are available either at the site or near the site. Um, obviously, it's going to take some time when an in individual stops at the charging station to charge their vehicle. So we would like for them to have something to do rather than just sit in their car. Um, hopefully, things that would contribute further to the, the economy. So. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, you might you may want to clarify the match requirement and the, the, how the funding works because I know it's 54 million at federal, but I believe there's a match requirement of that yes. from the private sector or whoever makes that proposal to actually install. Is that correct? Yes, um, Troy, if you can go back to slide 19. So this, that's it right there. So this shows uh, how much federal funding we are scheduled to receive each year of the program and then the required matching funds. So it's, it is an 820 federal match and that would be the minimum uh, match requirement uh, for the applicants through the, through the program. Yeah, that's good to know. So 20% on as proposals, as the consultant, whoever comes in with the proposal would then put up that 20% investment, be it yes, a private entity or utility company, whoever is the proposing entity that would make the actual investment. Correct. Whoever is submitting the application for that site. Okay. Thank you. Just to make sure I understood you correctly. So on, on this slide here, you said for example, on year 2022, that each station or each charging station is about a million dollars. So you're looking at how many stations? Well, for the funding that we're going to receive in fiscal year 22, so first of all, we, we will not receive this funding. It won't be released to us until the right. plan has been approved sometime toward the end of September. Then we'll receive the fiscal year 22 uh, funds. So. There's a portion of that that the department has been allowed to use to pay for the consultants, which we are we are paying the match for that federal funding uh, they're using for consultants and some uh, set aside for administrative costs. Other than that, 
there will be the eight million dollars in federal funding. I guess what I'm really, I guess, trying to ask is the number of stations. If we're looking at fifty-four million dollar grant, you're looking at fifty-four, maybe a few more with the matching park stations that are going to be funded by this over the entire program. Is that generally speaking correct? I'm sorry, can I, I did not catch part of that. So if you're looking at eleven million dollars. $13 million with the matching grant for years two through five. Is that fair to say that we're looking at funding 13 approximately stations per year or maybe? Yes, sir. Or first year a little bit less? Yes, sir. So if you had 54, 60 stations, how close to being, what was the term? Fully built out. Fully, yeah, fully built out. Does that get you? Right now, we're estimating that we would only need 15 additional charging stations in the state to reach that fully built out status. So but it goes a long 15 way. to $20 million to reach that point and the remaining funds, then we could move into the next phase. Okay, thank you. And that's for existing designated corridors, the 15 for this first year. For the interstates? For the 15 and, state, yeah, it's for yes. 30, 40, 49. It doesn't go beyond the 55 or some of the other areas that are not only alternate fuel corridors. Is that correct? That's correct. So we will see some build out after that, yeah. What about the state line? The state line? Of the existing designated area. Uh, now, we do have, we do have uh, five charging stations in the state that were, um, uh, constructed by private sector that meet all of the NEVI requirements. So we have those in place already. And some of you may have heard, but General Motors announced um, either Friday or over the weekend that they have signed a, a deal with Pilot to install charging stations at their facilities, their, their trucking facilities. Um, and from what I understand, those are gonna be 350 kilowatt charging stations. Nationwide. Brad, you might also want to, under the NIVI funding program, unless it's changed, each of those, even when we have fully built out and we go on other state routes, they still have to meet the 600 kilowatt construction. That, we haven't received a uh, word on whether you can right size those yet. That's correct. Uh, at this time, it hasn't, we haven't uh, had final decision on that. Uh, situation. We are hoping that we do not have to meet all of the NEVI requirements uh, in those other locations. We would like to be able to right size them depending on the uh, population of that area, depending on the traffic volumes and those those types of considerations. And the reason I bring that up is because why we're looking at the competitive grant also is that if you have to put a million dollar site in a very rural location with that much energy usage you may not have number one the energy and number two you may not ha have um, someone who wants to invest that much and bring up the match so we're hoping to right size those and put less than 600 kilowatts in some of those rural areas or at the very least maybe we'll get a competitive grant which then can go beyond just the one site or level twos and things like that I know we have several other agenda items, so I, I probably appreciate the information. Hopefully, encourage everyone to review the plan that's online. If you have a comment, get it to DOT by midnight tomorrow. Um, but uh, this is an ongoing conversation, so I don't. It's, as they said, uh, the rules are dynamic right now. We don't know when those federal rules will be finalized. A lot of the specifics that are in the proposed rules, and there is a lot of detail in those federal rules that these. Proposals. Once the awards are made, these uh, contractors are going to have to meet a lot of requirements. Uh, so, uh, because they're nationwide requirements, uh, it, it may be different than what they've done before. So, with that, I appreciate the work. I'm sure all of you are excited about the opportunities, but I'm going to shift now to Secretary Ward from the Department of Ag and allow you to also introduce your federal counterpart that I believe has been gracious and patient online with us for a virtual presentation as well. So thank you. Thank you, Secretary Keo. Appreciate that. And uh, Wes Ward from the Arkansas Department of Agriculture want to give just a, a quick update on um, 
our involvement with the IJA and, uh, and what we're looking at. So for, for us from a department, really kind of two pieces in particular. So one is, is forestry. Uh, so when, the, when the, the law was passed and I think the White House put out, there was going to be about $23 million to the state of Arkansas for uh, wildfire protection, fuel mitigation for the forestry side. Uh, we're not real sure that that number is accurate. Uh, we're still working on that. Uh, you know, I, I will say our state forester, Joe Fox, is uh, in pretty frequent contact with the U.S. Forest Service on what those programs are going to look like. I uh, even has a call with him tomorrow to talk about it some more. Forest Service keeps saying additional guidance and information is coming, and they keep saying it's coming, and so we're still waiting for it to come. Uh, but more to come on that. But if you look total uh, across the state of Arkansas, 19 million acres of forest land, uh, we'll, we'll get some some funding that will help with wildfire protection and fuel mitigation, but uh, comparatively speaking, it, it will be uh, relatively small compared to other things. Most of most of that money uh, through the uh, through the law that was passed is uh, for forestry and wildfires was was targeted mostly for the West, uh, as most people would imagine with the large wildfires that are taking place out there. But uh, we're involved in those conversations, and we'll certainly share share. Uh, what impacts that has on Arkansas as we move forward. Uh, the second piece is uh, is, is larger uh, for sure for, for us, and that, uh, that touches on the natural resources side uh, and our water uh, programs uh, coming through existing programs within the state, the hypoxia task force, as well as, well as our state revolving loan programs. Uh, so additional funding coming there, uh, 528 million or so for the uh, SRFs, but uh, that number is a little bit misleading. Uh, but I, I will let our, our natural resources director, Chris Callclazier, uh, talk a little bit about that and kind of what that looks like and how we're planning for that. And I just appreciate Chris's leadership uh, on that topic. Thank you, Wes. Yeah, so as Wes indicated, we're expecting around 528 million uh, over the next five years for water and wastewater projects. Uh, it sounds like a lot of money, but in a recent need survey that we did across the state, it was 5 billion in need. So these are a lot of our small rural water and wastewater systems across the state, especially with population decline. They don't really have the ratepayers to pay for these systems for you know major capital construction projects. So this is good, very helpful. Uh, for this current year, we're expecting somewhere around 93 million. Again, sounds like a lot of money, but only 46% of that can actually be used for a traditional water, wastewater, you know, capital improvement project. Some of the funding is uh, specifically for things like lead service line replacement. In fact, 46% of the money is, is tied specifically to that one thing. So that's improving lead service lines from the water main to the house. So that's not like a community's water main. That's actually the service lines going to the houses. So that's something that we're working on with the Department of Health. In fact, we just held two meetings uh, inviting stakeholders to come in and, and let us start talking about how we're going to do that. Um, the other is emerging contaminants. And I know my, our ADEQ counterparts could tell you what those are, but those are chemicals right now that we're not treating for, but a certain percentage of the funding has to be used for emerging contaminants, about 12% of the fund. So this is something that we'll be implementing over the next five years. It's additional funds to an existing program. So we already administer both the clean water and drinking water state revolving funds. So this is a plus up to those existing programs. Right now we'll apply for a work plan. So we have to submit a work plan or an intended use plan to EPA. And then we'll apply for the funding. One thing we're waiting on, there's a there's an American Rescue Plan decision for water, hopefully coming soon. So we're trying not to confuse the two because they have different requirements, um, different match, that sort of thing. So anyway, that's it on the SRF programs. Uh, Wes mentioned hypoxia funding. Uh, because Arkansas is one of 12 states that participate in a hypoxia task force, we'll receive about a million dollars a year to implement some water quality um, practices in certain areas across the state. We'll also be able to do some additional water quality monitoring. Uh, we have another opportunity with emerging contaminants for small and disadvantaged communities. This is something new that just came up, so we're looking at that. Um, and potentially stepping up and saying, yes, we want the funding and then applying for those dollars. And then last, we have a couple grant programs that we're looking at through FEMA. 
uh, the natural resources uh, division. We basically are in charge of inspecting about 431 dams across the state. So there's two dam programs. Uh, under one program, the National Dam Safety Program, we're requesting about $122,000. Um, what that's going to do is it will allow us to hire a dam, another dam inspector, but also allow us to hire a consultant to essentially come in and do a rubric, um, some analysis on the damages that some of our dams failed. Unfortunately for us, or fortunately for us, how you want to look at it, a lot of our dams are in rural areas. So if you look at loss of life or loss of property, uh, they're typically not going to be a lot of loss of life because they're in rural areas. And, but yeah, we don't compete well for federal funds because of that. So this is something that we want to come in and address. I know my counterpart here, Chris Fracy with Gaming Fish, they've got a lot of dams, but it's hard to find funding to fix those dams if they've got things wrong with them. And last, we have a, a high hazard potential rehabilitation grant program that we're applying for funds for two specific dams in the state. Um, and then last, um, we've been having lots of discussion with the Association of Arkansas Counties and with Deloitte uh, about uh, unpaved roads program in the state. That's a program that we fund and we work directly with counties. They're very eager and interested in trying to find structure uh, funds out there that may boost that program. So that's, those are areas where we're working. That I'd be happy to take any questions on the water side. Does anyone have questions? We're not going to let you out that easy, are we? Uh, I have one. <laughs> can, can you tell me where the irrigation or, or flood control, how does that fall into that funding mix? Is that a separate pot of money since it's not really a revolving loan? Or is, that, is there a set of funds that help our areas on any kind of yeah, right. stormwater management or... or or is that more a rescue act? I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be more rescue plan. Um, right now, if you look at the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, most of it's for those traditional water and wastewater type projects. Obviously, like the dam programs, I mean, that gets into some flooding uh, aspect there, but Quest funds under the American Rescue Plan for water, wastewater, and stormwater on top of what Infrastructure and Jobs Act is providing. Thank you. It wasn't a hard question. Anyway, well, good. Do you want to go on and continue to the next speaker then? Wes, would you like to make that introduction? We sure can. Okay. Yeah. Do you have another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, you know, we certainly have a, have a broad host of partners within the state of Arkansas, especially on the ag side. Uh, ag and water uh, and so we're, we're pleased to have uh, Mr. Keith Husky from USDA Rural Development with us today and uh, we'll turn it over to him hopefully the audio comes through I know he's joining us virtually to uh, to talk about their involvement with um, uh, the IJA and what what role they will play. So Keith we'll turn it over to you if you can if you can come through. Let's try this other microphone. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> yes, we can. Okay. Well, we can't thank see you. you. Yeah, we can. We can hear you, but not see you. But thank you. Well, do you want to see me? <laughs> it's fine either way. I, just, I wanted you to understand. If you wanted to be on camera, it's fine either way you want to do. It. Um. Well, we'll try putting myself on speaker. Well. Well, there you go. Anyway, um, well, Wes, thank you for that introduction. I want to thank the committee for, for letting me visit with you guys for a few minutes. Um, as I said, I'm Keith Husky, and I'm an area specialist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development, and I work out in the field office. Um, just two or three things I want to mention to you in this meeting today. Um, there's been discussion about, about funding that's been received through the American Rescue Act. American Rescue Plan Act. Um, the, the only program that USDA has received funding for has been through our Community Facilities Division. That's not water and waste that I'm here to talk about today, but 
the only the only program that we've gotten that from is through our emergency rural health care grant program. And in that program here in Arkansas, uh, we received $7.8 million. Uh, the application window closed October 1st, 2021. And uh, out of that 7.8 million, so far out of the applicants that have filed application, we have funded five projects that total seven, excuse me, $2.799 million funding five projects. And that's, that's been the Infrastructure and Jobs Act funding that we've received here at USDA Rural Development. We did not receive any, there wasn't any allocated for our water and wastewater program. Um, to talk about our water and wastewater program, just our, our, regular, our regular program, uh, that program in fiscal year 22 for Arkansas, we received $23.5 million in loan funds and $8 million in grant funds to use for applicants around the state of Arkansas. Um, and that, that program, that program is used to serve rural areas and towns that are 10,000 population and less. Um, the, um, the folks that are, that are able to apply for this program are most state and local governmental entities that, that run these water and sewer systems private nonprofits that serve these systems and federally recognized Indian tribes. Um, this funding is typically used for, for drinking water systems, wastewater systems, solid waste systems, and stormwater collection and disposal systems. And the main things that we can do with this program in addition to new construction, we, we can finance rehab and in, improvements uh, we can look at financing legal and engineering fees, uh, land acquisition if, if the project needs it for, for the project. Um, and let me see, on our loans, we can, we can go as long as a 40-year payback, 40-year payback as far as what, what they need to repay a loan. Uh, the customers that we serve, they must have the legal authority to incur loan and grant obligations. Uh, the facilities that are being funded with this money needs to be used for public purposes. And, uh, and this program can fight, we can, we can partner with other state agencies. So if the, so if the state of Arkansas has some funding, either, either regular funding or, or through, through COVID means, USDA can partner with, with funding for those if need be. Um, and, and we gotta be sure that these projects are financially sustainable. Uh, they, they gotta be able to, to pay for the system and, and repay the loan over the life of the loan. Uh, as far as accessing the system, usually these, usually these funding requests uh, they pull in a civil engineer that, that examines the, the system. They, they design a, a solution for the for what's going on. And then they help submit a funding request to USDA for, for funding through this water and wastewater program. Uh, we use an electronic funding system or electronic application system. And um, and in our, in our local offices, we, we work with our customers and our civil engineers about how to file an application electronically for those funds. Um, and that's really all I've got. Well, thank you. I do have one question. It may go back to Secretary Ward or, or, or Director of Closure. Um, I know I had the opportunity to go meet with water wastewater managers from the state uh, this past weekend. Um, with them and speak about infrastructure funding. But uh, one of the conversations that not only happened here, but with other states, we talk about smaller systems is you have a capital investment for the water wastewater plant, but then you also have ongoing operation and maintenance costs, which really we've seen at least in rural areas can be kind of the limiting factor of keeping those systems maintained over the life and, and really delivering compliant 
clean water or clean, you know, treated wastewater has been a struggle, um, you know, for those communities. So do we know, is any of the funds that we've heard of yet addressing the operation and maintenance side to assist these communities, or is that something that we should be talking to the federal agencies about the need for that? Because that's something I can take back to DC if that's not been addressed. I'll attempt to, to answer that question. So um, we typically do not pay for the maintenance and operation costs. Uh, one thing that we do when we're administering um, either loan or principal forgiveness grant dollar is one that they're charging enough to maintain their system and to repay the debt. So that's a requirement. If they're going to come receive funds from us, we need to make sure that they can repay the debt and take care of your system. In a lot of cases, we try to encourage folks to regionalize in some parts of the state. Um, for example, if they've lost, say, 50% of their population and they really can't take care of that system anymore, then we'll, we may even provide incentive where it's more grant than it is loan for them to regionalize. One thing I'll mention, too, is we work closely with rural development and others through the water and waste water, water advisory committee. So entities will supply applications <coughs> through that committee. And then we all get a chance to look at those to see which one is the better option for funding, whether it be us or, or rural development. Did that answer your question, Secretary? I think so. I, I just, I know that other states struggle as well in speaking with our, our neighboring states that have rural areas like Mississippi and Louisiana and even across the country, you know, when you get into some of the more rural states up in the Northeast and, and out West. So I just was curious if that's something we need to really put on the radar, if this is gonna be a long-term infrastructure, generational value in chain, you know, value, do we not need to make sure we're looking at life cycle cost as opposed to just the upfront cost to make sure these don't become you know, left behind later, you know, kind of issues. One thing I'll add is, is simultaneous to this, uh, the legislature passed Act 605 in the 21 regular session, which requires, you know, rural water providers to do a rate study. And uh, so there's, there's deadlines for doing those rate studies, um, which, you know, the rate study really points out what it costs is your system what you need to have in reserve for capital improvements um, and then whether or not you can actually implement the rates do you have enough rate payers to be able to do that so that's that's the one on right now all right well thank you these are excellent presentations any others have questions either any of the speakers thank you for joining us today so much from usda and I know that I've heard at the national level, USDA has, I guess, plus that some resources to some of the states. So I would encourage you, I don't believe Arkansas has received an infrastructure designated person in our Arkansas office. I put our name on the list to be a candidate for that when I talk to the federal USDA folks. So I can, I'll continue to champion that as it's needed, if that would be beneficial to you here in Arkansas. But thank you for being here today. No, thank you. All right. I, I, our next, we're going to shift back. I guess we could have this order a little different, but um, we're going to come back to talk about EV again. But this one is broadband and EV, I believe, is the way we've titled it. And we have a guest speaker, Kelly Eubanks, with Eco Rocks Energy Partners, uh, had, had asked if she could bend our ear a little bit on, on this issue. and. And with the public meeting laws, it's very difficult for us to convene three or four of us to come talk to her without doing it more publicly. So we want to make sure everyone has the benefit of your conversation today. So thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you, Secretary Keogh, and thank you to the committee for having us today. We are excited to have this dialogue with you. And we took a holistic approach in the perspective around broadband and electrification strategy. So I hope this is the beginning of a dialogue with you and a longstanding dialogue. Troy, could you go to the next slide, please? So I'd like to introduce who we are, Eco Rocks Energy. I'm Kelly Eubanks and I'm one of the partners with Eco Rocks Energy. I'd like to introduce my other two partners, Catherine Love and Fitz Lancifer. And thank you both for being here. 
Our goal is to provide solutions, customized solutions. And on this slide, I wanna point out just a few of these things. The engineered customized solutions, funding alignment. One of the things that's really key when you're tackling these types of initiatives is the funding that's out there, there's opportunities to layer that funding. And so we pride ourselves in looking at solutions in that way. Project implementation, project management, and post-implementation analysis. Our thought is that when you're attacking an initiative like this, it's important to tell the story, not just the, that we did it and that the dollars were spent, but what was the true impact to the communities that were served with those dollars and those efforts. Next slide, please. So in this dialogue today, we'll be looking at broadband as an enabler for an electrification strategy. And the reason that we took that approach is that our thought is you can get a lot more out of the funds that you apply to this effort by looking at it that way. The gentleman from Energy and from RDOT, they spoke about Wi-Fi enabled charging. Well, our thought is in addition to just Wi-Fi enabled charges, why couldn't you take that broadband infrastructure and allow that infrastructure for broadband to reach communities that need broadband access that don't have it today? And so we'll take a deeper dive into this, but this is the concept that we are bringing before you. Next slide, please. And now I'll introduce one of our partners and you'll hear about all of them before this is over, John Ringler who is from Siemens Unix Traffic. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, committee and, and um, uh, uh, Commissioner Q. My name is John Ringler, as, as Kelly said, I am with Unix Traffic. Unix Traffic is actually a former Siemens company. As of about July 1st of this year, we were bought by an Italian consortium uh, called Atlantia, and Atlantia is an infrastructure company. They own roadways, they own airports throughout the world. Rome Airport is one of theirs. They also own Autostrada, which is a large tolling company. Um, I'm, I'm actually from Atlanta, Georgia. And when I got here, I thought I knew what hot was, but when I got here, I, I, I figured out that I was wrong. Um, but I would like to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the EV charging infrastructure that, uh, that Unix provides. Um, in the left uh, diagram up here, you see what we would refer to as a complete turnkey service. I think this makes Unix somewhat unique. Uh, we are on the consulting side. We will do site selection. We'll look at your energy uses and how to plug to the grid. We want to do the product selection. And yes, we do provide Siemens chargers and they give us a great price on Siemens chargers. But we also want to make sure that we fit the right technology to the right use case and the right customers at the right price point. Uh, so we do have multiple different chargers in our portfolio, including Tritium. Uh, we provide the project management services all the way through the installation um, and the maintenance and operations. The one thing that we don't do, and we want to partner with local companies um, such as EcoRocks, is we don't do the back office. We don't want to handle the transactions, the financial transactions that are possible there as well. Um, a charger on the right hand side there is a, a location that we put into the United Kingdom. You can see the double decker bus in the background, but it just gives you some ideas of how you might be able to pair. Um, solar energy with the, the EV charging. So you're not buying it from the grid, you're buying it for free from other nature. Next slide, please. So one of the things that Kelly asked me to do is kind of look at the, the state of the condition of where we're at in the state of Arkansas currently. Um, and this is a, a website that I found that does a pretty nice job. If you've got an EV, these are some of the charges you can drive to throughout the country. And as you, next slide, please, as you drill down here a little bit, we're gonna take a look at, um, at Little Rock, and some of the things that jumped out at me, you probably won't be able to see this on the slide, but there's little icons in the center of those, um, the, the little bubbles that are up there. And one will be a T for a Tesla charging, and as was mentioned by R RDOT earlier, or Department of Energy, um, Mitchell, that um, those are not necessarily compatible chargers. So if you go out and you buy a Tesla, yes, you can buy an adapter that you can get a CCS charge, but if you've got another vehicle, you're not gonna be able to use those Tesla charging stations. Another little symbol inside those icons up there is an X, and those are chargers that are actually currently not working. What's really relevant here to me from a, a, um, somebody who's actually looking at buying an EV um, is none of these chargers are actually the level three chargers. They're all slow chargers, AC chargers. 
which means that once you get there, you're going to actually park for about eight hours before you can actually get your vehicle to about an 80% charge. Next slide, please. So some of the things that jumped out at me is we want to start mirroring the, the current state of the infrastructure with where we want to go is I want to do that against where we actually think the EV adoption rates are. And I did a little quick Google search and found out that Arkansas currently, as far as an EV adoption um, perspective right now, ranks about 45th out of the 50 states. And I think that includes the District of Columbia or plus District of Columbia. Next button, please. Uh, as I mentioned, many of these are offline or Tesla only, and we can probably skip through some of these here. Uh, very few fast charges, as I mentioned. And the, the work that, um, that RDOT done, has done with the Department of Energy, absolutely stellar work. I have an opportunity as Vice President of Business Development to get around a lot, and nowhere have I seen the advanced preparation that, um, that you guys put in. So kudos to the work that you guys have done. Um, next slide, please. Um, we've already talked about uh, the, the $7.5 million that are out there and available for, for funding. The $54.1 million is coming to the state of Arkansas. We've talked about that, and the two and a half billion dollars is coming in the competitive grants behind that. And I think the one more, the R dot line past or timeline is this month, and the federal timeline I think is sometime next year. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. And one more slide, please. All right. This is a nice little hockey stick chart or a diagram of where the EV adoption rate is currently. This is national, so this is not necessarily taking in where we're currently at in the state of Arkansas, but you can actually see you know, a fairly substantial increase. I would like to ask, how many people actually here own an EV today or a partially hybrid vehicle? Anybody? Anybody shopping for one since gas is five bucks a gallon? <laughs> We had two charging at our charging stations this morning, so I know we've got them in the building. Right? Yeah, there's, there's, there's some out there. Um, next slide. I'm actually in, in the market, but my VW is about 10 years old, so it's about time. And of course, if you've ever owned a VW, you know the electrics don't work after about five, five years. So this is uh, kind of the same, same uh, discussion that we had a little bit earlier, maybe just a little bit different illustration and, and from the private sector perspective, but we have our alternative fuel corridors that have been identified by the RDOT plan. And as you click the next slide, you actually see that the, the need is uh, kind of like the virus movie with Dustin Hoffman, um, actually uh, substantially broader um, than, than just the alternative fuel corridor. It begs the question, how are we going to get from that $54 million once that runs out into a, a broader deployment um, statewide? Because if you're in hope, you probably don't want to drive to Texarkana to actually build your vehicle. Next slide. So as I mentioned, some excellent work that's been done by um, the Arkansas Department of Transportation to find these alternative fuel corridors. Next slide, please. Uh, obviously, much more demand is, or much more is needed to be done. Um, it actually begs, it begins to, it actually begs an interesting question. Um, as we've seen with the reduction in, in um, vehicle miles traveled as a result of the pandemic, the DOT budgets have really suffered as a result. Um, and it, it, we're starting to, in, in the industry, starting to ask, ask the questions, how are we going to start to replace those motor fuel taxes? In my mind, there's a couple of places to do that, road user charging um, or EV stations you can collect at the pump. Next slide. And one more slide beyond this, please. So we're actually finding as a, as a private entity or a private business, they're looking at uh, doing a lot of EV sales and, and providing these current free services. Who are the customers that are actually coming to us right now? And the vast majority of the customers are coming to us for the private sector. Um, this was a business model that we did, a performer business model for a um, hospital system not too far from here um, in a different state. And they wanted to do 96 chargers uh, just as a, as a performer here. Those 96 chargers are going to cost them about $4.1 million. Now, that was a mix of some level three chargers, with probably the vast majority of them were actually the level two chargers. Um, we actually began then to project revenue, um, and we wanted to project revenue after those energy costs. So, as we did that, we wanted to actually take a look at a at a gross margin after energy costs, and you see the green lines. So, there's a startup in 2023. Uh, we actually plan to complete the installation of the chargers this year. A startup in 2023, and then we actually start hitting pace in the 2024 through the 2027 timeframe. The red lines that are coming off of that uh, represent your operations and maintenance costs. We talked about operations and maintenance budget. 
Um, and in this case, we looked at maintenance. We want to provide a white glove maintenance for this particular commercial entity. Um, so that's around $600,000 a year on the maintenance. And, and then the back office support as well in those financial transactions representing about 20%. But just a performa. But with this performa alone, we're finding that there's not only a tremendous amount of interest from Siemens Financial Services and sitting on their billions of dollars to deploy infrastructure across the United States, um, but also from uh, uh, several other entities as well. Um, so it's a, a very exciting opportunity to be in this industry. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, but uh, we have been doing this work for the last 10 years, and we do it in 25 countries with a principal footprint in the United Kingdom. And I think that's, that's it. So, Kelly. Could you advance, please? One more time. And one more time, please. Thank you. OK. So when I first set up, I talked about that our approach is a technological advance because we're looking at this holistically. So this map is meant to illustrate where broadband meets EV. And that's an important conversation because if we can leverage the broadband infrastructure to enable electric vehicle charging, we can also penetrate into communities that do not have broadband today. And Troy, would you mind advancing one more time, please? Thank you. So those dots that you see on that map, they represent a seven mile broadband coverage radius. And this is meant to illustrate what you could actually do when you are tapping into a singular bucket for funding, you can, to say it in a layman's terms, two birds with one stone. You can accomplish two things with that funding. There's some cost data up there, but the key takeaway here that I'd like to leave the committee with is that this allows the state to allocate you know, it's, it's funding in areas that just aren't reachable today if you look at these two initiatives separately. And that's where we feel that the innovation and the synergies lie. To advance, please. So I mentioned our partners, and I'd like to introduce Al Adjaho from Redify. Al, would you wave your hand or say that? Great. Resify is a company out of Georgia as well. That's a broadband leader, a leader in installing fiber and other broadband solutions uh, in both rural and underserved communities. And their one of their most recent projects is doing the fiber for Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, as well as also laying fiber along the Atlanta Beltline to reach underserved communities. And so. We didn't have enough time to get into a lot of the use cases with data because we've got 15 minutes. I know Troy, you'll let me know when we're, when we're there. But I do, did want to mention to you that the makeup of EcoRocks Energy, our success is, in, is due in part to our thought process, but also to the partners that we bring to the table. Another gentleman spoke earlier today about workforce development. And I want to bring our third partner up specifically to address multi-craft contractors. They are an Arkansas-based company. They have a footprint in over 26 states with skilled workforce. And so when we started having this conversation, it was important to us to address something that you brought up, which is, well, you just can't have just a warm body doing this type of work. And so we specifically sought out a company that A, has the capacity and ability to perform workforce development, but also has skilled workforce in place that can be an extension of the efforts were we to be able to partner with the state. So that was also part of the thought process here. It's very important with anything that we do that dollars stay in the community, that they circulate locally. Do you advance to the next slide? So our proposal to you today is a pilot. We wanna prove this out. We'd like to work with you to select a site, put in broadband, put in electric vehicle charging, 
and come back to you and tell you this is the outcome of that. We believe that it will meet the desired outcomes that you're looking for. We believe that we can show you the alignment with funding. We believe that we can show you the social impacts to the community. And that could be a number of things because broadband access and electric vehicle charging together, they do things such as they empower community when it comes to telemedicine, empower community when it comes to mobility, empower a community when it comes to education. These are things that are important to multiple stakeholders. And so I would ask that the committee consider our proposal to do a pilot. And you might say, okay, well, what if we said yes today? You have some ideas. Yes, we've got several sites that we would love to put before you for consideration. And with that, could you go to the next slide, please? And so with that, I'd like to just close out with some key takeaways. And if I were to sum this up with one key takeaway, looking at it holistically gives you the most value extraction out of the level of effort and the funds that you're going to have to put against this. And so I would ask you to strongly consider a holistic approach here. And we are welcome uh, we're here welcoming questions. We'd love to have a dialogue with you. We are going to stick around and we'll be able to have a dialogue if you want to do that after the meeting. But certainly we appreciate the committees and your any thoughts that you might have. Did I just do a good job? Because there's no questions or <laughs> I think we've had a full, a lot to think about today. So, but no, I think you did an excellent job and, and I'm particularly intrigued by the synergy and the, the ability to combine what I heard workforce earlier, but also deploying investment into those communities in a, in a you know, understandable way that really delivers on multiple levels for the community. So I, I know that's something that we would need to work with our broadband office on and, and as they're developing, but uh, something we should, but I think this is a very interesting idea as we look forward to looking at what other funding sources might be available, particularly as we perhaps a competitive type uh, grant. This might be very attractive to uh, to show where this, this could benefit from. So, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I didn't touch on all of them, but again, there is a layering opportunity, crypto, um, cybersecurity funding, rule development funding, you know, other funding outside of the uh, infrastructure. And that, that would be a helpful conversation to have is where, how do we package that maybe? Absolutely. So that, that's great. Thank you. Well, the other people have questions before? I think we lost one. Okay. Well, I know we're, we're at the end of our, uh, hour and a half that we allocated for the meeting. And I hope I hope you'll indulge me. I, I think the only thing remaining on this was uh, agenda was uh, next steps. Uh, really specifically, I believe um, the next steps kind of lay out in your staff report that's attached with your agenda. You'll see, as I mentioned earlier, I, I tell people when I go to these meetings, it's like drinking from a fire hose. I think we're really drinking now we're about to be submerged if you look at the opportunities hitting in July August September I counted over 40 different funding grants and proposals or notices that we're being asked to look at and respond and it's going to take all of us to, to really see what what fits for Arkansas and to be able to keep the governor's office and others informed about what we think is an important priority for us advance and we, we, we know this is a five-year process, but it seems like, you know, it's this framework that we're laying this year that's critical that we get in on the front end of it. But um, that, that's all I'll draw your attention. As far as for the committee, we'll be notifying you. Uh, probably try to take the same approach, come back in about a month and cover a few other program areas where the state's seeing benefit or perhaps where some of you can share the priorities that you're looking at perhaps in commerce and uh, some of our other departments, maybe, you know, in our uh, FEMA areas or things like that. So look forward to talking to you more. Is there any questions generally for the committee at this point?
If not, I'll consider the meeting adjourned. So thank you for being here. <laughs>